Yeah, I will speak into the mic. Okay. Um, I'm kind of disobedient, so this, uh, this part is going to be a little bit deviant. Waiting at police, waiting in police stations, part one. I was at the beginning of two years with Via at Ekip Sanata Dharma, a Catholic teacher's college in the court city of Jogjakarta. Jogjakarta is in central Java, home to a vast proportion of Indonesia's population and the elite who mostly run the nation state. I was not exactly at the beginning, mind you. That came earlier when I spent a week in Jakarta with a half dozen other volunteers and Julia Hilgard, who helped us find our feet or earlier still in Kuala Lumpur where the youth hostel lost our reservation and Sarah Whitmore fell into a sewer on our way to a brothel masquerading as a hotel. <laughs> or even earlier during the two weeks the entire cohort spent in Japan where Dwight Clark shepherded us through homestays and a few days at the monastery at Koyazan where we sat on our heels, ate very soft tofu and got trounced in softball by friendly and not slightly bemused monks. That said, my time waiting in police stations marked a particular starting point, the starting point of my career as an anthropologist. I had a visa. I had permission to be in the country, or at least so I thought. And yet permission is strangely distributed in Indonesia with gatekeepers at every level of social life. Upon arrival, I had to report. I had to get a kate pay, a residence card that would affirm my right to be where I was. I still have my kate pay, orange with a black and wo white photograph of me smiling hopefully into the camera. It's not surprising I found it worth saving over the years. This card was the fruit of long hours, not of effort, but of immobility, the fruit of learning to wait. First, I had to go and see Paklura, Mr. Local Neighborhood, an ordinary citizen deputized to occupy the lowest rung of the bureaucracy. I was with Gari, a spunky graduate of Sanata Dharma, who invited me to live with her family the first time we met. Mr. Local Neighborhood carefully copied my information into a ledger and pulled a piece of paper into an ancient manual typewriter. We sat politely on a plastic-covered couch. Before me was a glass of tea, viscous with sugar. I had not yet removed the plastic cap. I was watching Gari, and hers remained firmly in place. Mr. Local Neighborhood eventually invited us to drink by saying mango, the one Javanese word I still remember. Twenty minutes went by, and a letter finally appeared, tucked into an envelope labeled with a string of cryptic names and numbers. The most honorable Mr. Head of Village, Kaliorang 8, Jogjakarta 12, DIY 1, reference XX137III. I worked my way up the ladder. Each official produced a letter directed at the next in line until the process spat me into the security apparatus, which was ultimately responsible for keeping an eye on people like me. And so I found myself in a barrack surrounded by men with oily hair, tan uniforms, and holsters. A man in a guard tower waved me into an office where a bored policewoman had me write down my name, hand over my documents, and take a seat. The ritual glass of tea materialized on the table, the fan spun softly overhead, and I watched meekly as the policewoman vanished behind a closed door. The label on it read Kapolrem, an acronym for Chief of Divisional Police. She emerged five minutes later, Sementar, in a bit, she told me. And so I settled into the vinyl sofa, prepared for what I knew would be a patience-testing ordeal. Via had loaded me for bear for this ordeal, the bear of my deeply ingrained American habits. An American would get annoyed at being asked to wait. She'd take down names. She'd threaten to file a complaint. She'd play the agreed victim. She'd get red in the face. She might even shout. Dripping in sweat from the tropical heat, she'd become a spectacle and nothing would get done. Of course, nothing was getting done now. <laughs> as my hard-won letters languished on the police chief's desk as he sat, or so I imagined, taking a nap. Except, and this was a big except, within my internal machinery. I was working hard at becoming Javanese. I sat upright with my knees drawn together, breathing deliberately. I had my shin-length cotton skirt covering my legs. 
I was motionless enough to detect the slightest breeze from the fan on my hair. I was feeling the moments pass, concentrating on maintaining a stillness within, as sturdy as the stillness without, feeling duration just as strongly as I felt hunger creeping into the pit of my gut. I stared at the lid on my tea, the shiny blue plastic. I was imagining the feel of the sweet liquid on my lips, the tiniest sip, just a few drops, which I would ingest when invited, before returning the glass to the coaster and covering it. I listened to a fly. I inspected the barred windows. I waited. At 2 p.m., when the office closed, I still didn't have my document. I came back the next day and waited some more. Part two. But I wasn't just learning to wait. I was also learning to watch. I saw things in that police station. A portrait of President Suharto, the armed forces commander who took power in 1965. Another picture showing Suharto shaking the police chief's hand. The way the small man who arrived to take out the trash crouched as he passed my chair. The way the bored policewoman looked right through him. I noticed the smell of garlic and its sizzle through the barred window from what I imagined to be the kitchen for the jail. I noticed the pang of fear I felt when I looked across the courtyard to what I thought might be cells, cells filled with journalists, students caught with banned books, and young volunteer teachers like me who had read a lot of Marx. <laughs> Later, I would think back on my efforts to become Javanese with skepticism. Violence made culture, wrote John Pemberton, a former Java, Java lover turned cynic in an anthropology dissertation I read in my first year of graduate school. Pemberton made much of the political implications of the traits I noticed that day, the fear and the calm, the hard-won reserve. The success of a ritual, an election, or a visit to a police station was measured by the fact that nothing occurred. I was also learning to notice things that happened when nothing was supposed to be happening. The longer I stayed in Jogjakarta, the more I learned to value the matter out of place. My Chinese-Indonesian students whose families hid their shrines. The rebels turned children's library activist I met when I took over Jill Tucker's book collection and the rice barn where she lived. Not to mention Gari, who bantered with Bob Keilberg on our first day in town. Somehow, the topic of birds, burung, came up. Yes, I have a bird, said Bob, presumably meaning a pet. So you have a bird, said Gari, archly. And her girlfriends choked on giggles. Burung means penis in Indonesian slang, something that Bob did not know. <laughs> Nor did he know he would fall in love with Gari and eventually marry her in front of the kelp bed at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Nor did he know that she would train to be a French chef in Palo Alto before moving with Bob to Santa Monica, where he works for Sony Pictures, and they are both practicing Sufis. As for me, I found myself drawn to Indonesia's margins, which took me to Erie and Jaya, now called Papua, where I waited in police stations as well. If I had time, I would tell you about one particular episode from my fieldwork in Biak how Philip Yampolsky and I were working on an album of Biak music, and I thought we had gotten permission to record a group in a politically sensitive part of the island. How we'd got, gotten the requisite letter, and even better, a Papuan policeman to come along. How we stopped at the local police station to report in. How the officer on duty, a Batak with a limp, rejected our letter and told us we had to go back to Biak City how he chased us down in his Jeep when we drove further down the road to turn around, how he pulled a pistol on us when the Papuan policeman tried to explain. This was another kind of waiting, unfortunately familiar in Papua, waiting to find out what will happen when you look down the barrel of a gun. My dissertation fieldwork doesn't belong to my memories of Via, yet it called on me to apply lessons I learned in Via. Lessons learned while learning to wait. <laughs>